Hey there. In this video lesson, I want to talk to you about functional dependencies, which are a part of what we need to cover when we talk about normalization. And you may be wondering, what in the heck is normalization uh, beyond uh, another obvious uh, fancified uh, database word? So normalization is not that big a deal. It's nothing to panic over. It is basically a different approach to a sane and sensible data model and data representation that if we apply it right for our purposes will get us basically to the same exact place as appropriate ER diagramming would have. And you might wonder, well, why the heck are we bothering with it then? And that's a fair question, but there's an answer. And that answer is that understanding the normalization-based approach to getting to the same place that ER diagramming would get us allows us to better understand the consequences of not modeling appropriately and helps us figure out how to avoid those problems and, more importantly, how to denormalize or step away from what the ER diagram would get us without getting ourselves in seriously deep design hot water. And we won't talk in this class much about denormalization, but for my money, the best rate reason to learn normalization is because it sets the stage for learning later about denormalization. Um, and normalization can be treated very formally and be very scary and mathematical and complicated. That will not be our route. Functional dependencies will be about as rigorous as we get in our treatment of normalization. And with that, let's get right into it. So before we learn exactly what a functional dependency is, let's talk about how we represent one. So we represent them as follows. A arrow pointing at B. This is A functionally determines B or B is, and I'm going to abbreviate here, functionally determined by A. Okay, and that's this is the representation. This, these two things are what the representation means. Okay, so that's representation. What does it mean for A to functionally determine B or for B to be functionally determined by A? And I think here it is helpful to make a um, a concrete example and hopefully I can sneak in and not run off the edge of the page here. Uh, let's talk about Social Security number. So we can say SSN arrow F name. And that is in fact a good example of a functionally determining, re determining relationship. And let me let me rewrite that real quick. SSN Deter functionally determines F name, F name being first name. So the first thing we note here is that functional determination in a normalization context, it has to do with attributes. Social security number is an attribute, first name is an attribute, right? And so what it means that SSN functionally determines first name is that for, and this will sound really familiar, for a given SSN, there can be only one value for F name. Right? Simple, and I know my handwriting's not the best, you'll have to bear with me, it's tough writing on a tablet where you can't really see what your pen is doing. But we know if, the, if we have 
someone's social security number. If we know we're talking about the person 1111-22-3333, that person is only ever going to have one first name. Holding aside people with criminal backgrounds who use aliases or actors who use aliases or anything like that, we're talking plain vanilla circumstances in like a human resources database. A given employee with a given social security number is only ever going to have one value for the name. Okay, And so you will note, and that, that's common sense, right? You'll note that this sort of uh, is reminiscent of cardinality, right? Where we had 1 to 1 and 1 to n and etc. And it is somewhat similar, except cardinality is, of course, entities and functional determination is, of course, attributes. Okay, so one thing I want to impress upon you. When we were deciding what the cardinality relationships, what the cardinality of the entities participating in our relationships were, we had to, whether we were deciding whether something was this or this or, or many to many and so forth, we had to look to the nature of the problem itself. Um, and functional dependencies are exactly the same way. And the important thing to take note of there is you can't know FDs by the data alone. However, we can rule FDs out, but not in. Okay, and let's look at an example of that. Let's say we have, and this one's real easy because it's pretty obvious from the attributes, but let's say we have author and book, or title, I guess would be better, but uh, let's, and let's say Stephen King and it and Melville don't know they deserve to be in the same list, but uh, and Moby Dick and Stephen King and Carrie. Okay, so my chart to you in this example would be what now we know we can't rule fun functional dependencies in based on the data, but we can rule them out based on the data. You, looking at this, what functional dependencies can we rule out? And remember, we're looking at does author determine book? I don't know, does it? And does book determine author? I don't know, does it? And we know that if this were true, we would say a given author for a given author, there can only be at most one book. And that sounds pretty dubious, right? And that sort of evokes cardinality again. Uh, and here, for a given book, there can only be one author. So let's look at the data and see if we have anything that can rule something out. So here's what you need to look for. We've got two instances of the same value for the author attribute, right? And then you have to look do they result, are they associated with the same title value? And they aren't. So basically we've got king and it and king and carry. So can we say that for a given instance of author, say Stephen King, that there will be at most one book? Well, we can't. One, off, one instance of author, king, two instances of book it and carry. So we know conclusively that this is not true 
and we can cross that right out. What about book functionally determining author? Well, we have three different books, so we can't say for sure. We know that if we added, um, and I don't really have room for it, but if we, ha if we added um, Smith and it, then we would have the same value for book and two author values associated with that single value of book. And then if, if this were the real deal, then we could rule this one out as well. However, this is not the real deal. This is, this is imaginary data, this whole Smith business. That doesn't exist. And so we continue to have a question mark around whether book functionally determines author or not. We cannot conclude, we can't rule it out based on the data that are in the tables right now. We can use a little common sense and say, all right, you know, for a given book, would there be at most one author value? Well, that's fine until you have books with multiple people involved in their authorship. Uh, collected works, or collected works are generally the same author. Um, you know, edited books with articles contributed by different people, books that were written by famous people and, help in, and had uh, writing helpers. There's lots of circumstances we can imagine where this, this would not be the case. But we can't tell from these data here. And so I hope that this gives you some basics on what functional dependencies are and how to look at data and decide whether there's functional de dependencies or not. Um, there is going to be homework problems involving this, just FYI. What I recognize at this point I have not given you is why do we care? That's an important thing to want to know, and I hope you've been thinking that throughout these 12 minutes or so. Um, and my answer there is stay tuned. In the next video, we will discuss anomalies, what they are, why they are problematic, and how understanding functional dependencies can help us ferret them out. And in a broader sense, how abiding by normalization principles up to the third normal form will help us avoid some really problematic anomalies and related problems. So until then, study hard and I will see you online.